all ships have ballast, and Noah's Ark would have been no exception. But because of the exotic combination of metals contained in these masses, the evidence indicated that perhaps as the ship was constructed, the slag or waste product of the metal production of the ship's fittings was placed in the hull as ballast. John Baumgartner had contacted Ron after examining the specimens Colonel Irwin had sent to Los Alamos, and it was this specimen that first attracted his interest. Uh, in 1979, uh, I found uh, that the group in 1960 had blown away a portion of the hull, and uh, at this point, some of the ballast in the boat uh, was exposed, uh, and at the surface, I broke off a small portion of this and brought it back for analysis, and the analysis showed that it was 84 percent manganese. Now, this is a rather sophisticated space-age metal, and uh, these analyses get to be rather expensive very quickly, and when you get an unexpected analysis, uh, the uh, thing to do is to have other labs do a check on the same material to see if they get the same results. We couldn't afford that, but Jim Irwin, when I showed him the analysis, expressed an interest in getting it checked, so I gave him a part of this ballast, which he uh, sent to Los Alamos National Laboratories, and uh, he said that he would wanted to do that, and it was fine by me. They got the identical results, so I received a phone call from uh, Dr. John Baumgartner, uh, quizzing me about the site, the location uh, of the object in the area, and uh, I could tell that he was trying to uh, figure out something from my description of the area, so I invited him to come along, and he agreed to do so and brought two other individuals from Los Alamos with him. Uh, and I found out later that uh, they had concluded because of the nature of the analysis that a uh, part of a satellite or uh, a missile had come in out there and uh, so that uh, uh, did help our investigative procedure considerably. One critic took it upon himself to declare that these specimens were manganese nodules which are found by the billions of tons on the Pacific Ocean floor. However, Ron's specimens weren't taken from the Pacific Ocean floor, nor did they compare in composition or size with these manganese nodules. Manganese nodules average about 35% manganese dioxide, and they also include copper and nickel. The ARC specimens contained no nickel or copper, but they do contain titanium and aluminum. In fact, the ARC specimens contain exactly what would be expected in waste product of high-tech metal alloys. In 1990, Ron, Marv and Renetta Wilson of Dallas, Texas, Tom Allen of Switzerland, and myself decided to spend some time examining the house Ron believed was Noah's. The ancient stone fences could still be easily seen extending out in all directions from the house, only their tops extending above the earth. But another interesting feature was the large rock behind the house that looked like an altar. So we all hiked up to it and found not only the large rock, but a complex of rocks that clearly had been arranged by humans for some purpose. We're standing up here next to the uh, altar stone. We're to the right, looking down into Kazan. You can see the lay of the fencing as we pan.
digging out here, too, right? <coughs> Everywhere. These stones up here have obviously been placed in this manner. They're quite large. In fact, they're extremely large. As you can tell by Deal of R standing there. Could easily put, say, the sacrificial animals in here, Ron? Probably. Now, we're in the little area. There was a doorway. Here we are in another pinned in area. As we pan over here is the very large stone that we suspect would be the altar. When we climbed upon the hill around the large rock, we discovered it to have excellent acoustics like a large amphitheater. Okay, I'm standing up on the stone now. It was quite a big step. Of course, there's a lot of moss on it, and we look out straight dead ahead at Noah's house, and then just beyond there, Kazan. Right over here, the pen, possibly where the animal was brought to be prepared, the little place sure you good. where its blood was shed and drained. And Ron says that he can hear me quite well just talking in a normal voice here. Renetta and I measured the altar as we now refer to it and found it to be an extremely weathered, 12-foot cube with a step in the back which was about three feet above the ground. Standing upon this step and looking over the altar, we had a magnificent view of the entire region. The house and its system of fences was directly below. The rocks on the side were arranged in a manner that was consistent with being pens for medium-sized animals. There were also two large rocks which seemed to have been shaped. Okay. okay, this is designed to kill and bleed bullocks, or large cattle is the term used in the Bible. They bring them up this ramp here and they chip this out <coughs> and also chipped out here so the animal could be led and somebody behind swatting it appropriately would get right up here. Then they could turn it around and then bind its feet and legs of course and lay it down with the head down this way and cut its throat and of course the blood would all run out and Noah was specifically instructed that they should not eat the blood of the animal and of course there were other parts too. All the rocks had suffered a tremendous amount of weathering, but it was quite evident that many had been arranged by humans. However, it would have taken a large number of very strong men to have moved some of these boulders. One was leaning against the cliff face in a manner which formed a roof, and it was so large that I could walk under it without stooping.
I don't think there's any chance that uh, oh. anybody around here moved this rock here. That rock is gigantic. You better need some help. Ron believes this was Noah's altar, where his family met during the times of their sacrifices. We then walked down to the house and spent a long time examining the area. We found no evidence that the area had been inhabited for a great number of years. Okay, we're looking at Noah's house here. Trying to be very um, discreet as one of the villagers is come up here next to us. We're looking at the fencing now. You can see how it went across the hill, up high also, and even all along the top. Now we're surveying the fencing from the other way. The sun's pretty bright. I'm trying to shade it. Here we can see the fencing that ran up beside the house. This gives us a real good view of the fencing right behind it. In 1990, Ron conceived an idea which he thought might help demonstrate the condition of the ship. The western side had suffered a tremendous amount of deterioration and weathering. The exposed ribs were virtually gone, leaving only the impressions in the soil surrounding them. But the eastern side contained a section which appeared to still contain some of the petrified although severely fragmented rib timbers still in place. In October of 1990, Ron and Richard Reeves went to the ark and took shovels, whose blades they bent and sharpened like giant razors. Scraping just a few inches of matrix from the side, they hoped that the petrified ribs would be able to be seen. These ribs were fragmented due to weathering since they were so near the surface. But due to their slant, the soil around them had held them in place. Very carefully, assisted by Delavar, who had accompanied Ron since March of 1985 as his taxi driver, began to scrape. They realized they had to be extremely careful to remove only a very few inches. Okay, what we plan to do here is to shave the rib timber part of this uh, section of the hull and, of course, the texture between the rib timbers and the material that has covered the boat are different in color and uh, of course in density and that sort of thing and so we uh, are going to be able to show the dimensions of the timbers here by doing it this way.